Hi, how are we all today? Very well. Uh, Thank you for attending the call. It is I a great for... pleasure to start connecting the Australian um, uh, pioneers, if I can say. Definitely, definitely. There are still some of us pioneers that was out there in 1995. Um, but what we all came across is we needed long-term thinking. Yes. And it really starts now. Yes. I got into it in 1995. So what I wanted to show you is our Teamsters that we've been, that we've been working with. Um, now, I will just get the boys up. Now, let's see. Do you guys recognize this, this crowd here? Yep. Yep. Only one of them. We all we all know John Johnny Muir. Yeah. This gentleman is in is in solar. He's ex Austrade. Everybody knows Johan, yeah. which is Geosip Bricks. He just passed away, God rest his soul. He's my business partner, and this is my Chinese business partners, these two guys here. Can you see that, gentlemen? Rich? Okay, you're on mute. All right, let me show you a little bit more. This is also, we understand that hemp is a great source for carbon sequestration, yeah? And we know that grain can be sold, herd can be sold, and fiber can be sold. We know that antibacterial and antibiotic properties such as cattle feed, hemp, honey, much along the same lines, Richard, as I think what you were talking about. Now, the other area is we've got to create educational centers, much like what, uh, Richard, where you were at the time, with before with Wadsey. Just nod your head if you can hear me. Richard, okay, good, just checking. So one of the job creation areas that we discussed back in 1995 was being able to create an industry rather than import it, which is where we were doing it for our retail stores. If you guys can see behind me, the cargo hold sailing ship, that was our logo in 1971. And of course, what do we know about sails? They were all made out of hemp. The Napoleonic War was about hemp from the French and the English to get supply. So the, all of these things played a key part in the processes. So I'll show you, a, I'll show you 19, I'll show you the uh, PowerPoint presentation that we have for you. The other, the other area that we learned after I went into retailing was that the pest of the hemp plant. The major pest is the heliothus moth. Shake your hands if, uh, shake your heads if you've come across the heliothus moth, guys. Hemp engineering, Kim. You, you've heard, you've heard of, uh, of the heliothus. No. Now I can hear you. Sorry. Okay. The hill, David. You know the heliothus. Yeah, Gary. Yeah. Gary had a problem with the heliothus. Uh, other people had problems with heliothus. So what we what we propose is this was developed for the hemp industry, but uh, it was just too early, and it was going against the pesticide industry. So what happens is at nighttime, the heliothus and the fall armyworm fly by night. They see the light, they see the light on the top because hemp is a fairly tall, can be a tall plant. Depends what type of plant you're growing, right, Richard? Some are tall, some are tall, some are short. Yeah. So what we found was this one turns on, the moth flies at night, sees the light, this turns off and this one down here turns on and it is a water trap and it can capture, this is in, in plantation. Get the next one up. That's a, 
too fast. Sorry about this, gentlemen. There's our vortex light traps that was in Narrabri. And there they are in the field. And there's, that is the vortex. Can you guys see the vortex? Shake it, just give me a up and down. Can you see the vortex in the background there near next to Charles yeah. Covet? Not really, but yes, 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 yeah, but it's a little, yeah, like yeah, maybe if you expand the photo. Yeah, I wonder whether, yeah, I can do that. Hang on a tick, bear with me. Can you see that better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, this gentleman, I think you all recognize this gentleman. That yeah. is, uh, that is Dr. Stuart Gordon. He has also now become not just the hemp expert in Victoria, but also the fall army worm person in Victoria. So generally when we do talks, Charles, this is at the AIHA meeting in the surf coast in Victoria near um, Torquay, where we were educating the growers onto the hemp industry. And this is a one night, this could be a one night's catch. Pretty awesome, huh? Oh, wow. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we've just rebirthing the trap, not just for the hemp industry, but for the fall army worm. Um, just bear with me for a minute. Okay, now then. The other, the other thing that I talk about in a lot of cases is pesticide exposure, depression amongst male pesticide applicators. The other is the pesticide effects on soil biota. Then we have pesticide detection in Australian waterways. And we have also a media report that does show what, how effective our vortex light trap is. And, and by saying that, each one of these traps, such as that, can handle five to 10 hectares, proven by CSIRO, and been tested in Malaysia for the rhinoceros beetle in palm plantations, because the, the rhinoceros beetle will also attack. I don't know actually whether the rhinoceros beetle would attack the hemp. I know fall armyworm, after talking to John, John Whiteman, the fall armyworm doesn't attack the hemp plant, the major pest is the Heliothus, and that's where, where I've been coming from. Um, and again, if you don't know what, uh, what a uh, scarab beetle looks like or, uh, or a rhinoceros beetle, that's a cat. That's a one night's catch in Malaysia. Um, and just to give you a quick idea, this is how the vortex works. And it can, as I said, you've, you've seen it. So what happens is, do you recall seeing the other light uh, in the paddock before? Can you hear the water? So it causes a water vortex, which sucks the insect into the, into the trap. Now, the other is, open. Can you guys see that at all? Not really, just your screen, just your screen. Yeah. What you see is what we get, my man. <laughs> yeah. Just trying to work out where this went to. Okay, that should, that should be, move that down. That's it. Okay, can you guys see that at all? No. We're not doing real well here, guys. 
my computer is giving us grief at the moment, as you can oh, see. Oh, don't worry about it. We are not in a super exposition. Or <laughs> All right. So the so next I'll, one will do better. Uh, yeah, exactly. So what we're talking about is the challenge and the complexities of hemp. There is thousands of products that can be made, as we all know. And I think, Richard, you covered quite a few of those, if I'm not mistaken. Um, where we started looking at is to have a strategic plan to understand what the key stakeholders are and are needed to build a successful hemp industry, which is what we're all wanting to do, right, David and uh, Kim and Richard and all? Yes. We need to identify the possible ways in which government can assist building the new industry based on industrial hemp, as it has already created in the hemp industry for medicinal cannabis. We are the... I have one question for, for everybody in this uh, talk, is which market is going to be bigger, industrial hemp? You can shake your head up and down if you say industrial hemp or medicinal cannabis. Oh, industrial hemp, absolutely. Exactly. The problem with industrial hemp, and David Shields and I have spoken about this on many an occasion, is the problem with that is there is no processing, as I mentioned before. So in France, uh, uh, Kimberley's, Kimberley papers, they write, they uh, manufacture the Bible in hemp because it doesn't uh, deteriorate. So again, th there are many benefits of, of what we've discovered over the time. And we need something like what was invented for the cotton, you know, the cotton gin in 1750. You know, it, it has never been possible for hemp fiber to compete commercially with cotton, but now we believe that that can change. We've got some interesting technologies that I'd like to also introduce you to, and it increases hemp growth by between 100 to 150% proven by an Israeli whose company is called Creso Pharma. Now, Creso Pharma is on the Australian Stock Exchange and it's globally duly listed in Canada, where we believe that the next big market, as you said, is going to be the industrial hemp market, but we need the processing facilities for that. And that. Well, I believe Mr. Ron is a, is a summatory of elements that we need to put together. It's a big puzzle of, of pieces. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, processing is very important as it is having prototypes and building a strong marketing funnels to put the, um, the product out. I'm not so keen, personally speaking, uh, of um, getting support from the government itself because the government has been traditionally in the last 80 years the support of the prohibition. So it is like expecting having a good dinner with a pedophile and sitting with kids. That's not gonna happen. They don't care, truly, if they could care, the laws could have been changed already and the market and the free market could have been already implemented. But no, that is not the case, unfortunately. There is an overall overprotective market for traditional products and it's still giving a lot of obstacles for hemp products to be manufactured um, uh, in, in, in large scales in matter. So I believe that those people who are dancing what the government is pretending to do, that is basically they are just dancing because um, the truth of the matter that the true pioneers, the people who are in this business for changing the world, we understand that the prohibition is real and the war on drugs is, 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 is there. There are hundreds of people still in the jail just for because, uh, smoking a joint. The laws are wrong and, and expecting the government to give us money to build houses, even though it's, uh, very, it's good for the planet, it's not happening, not even close. As a group, I wanna, I wanna make this very, very clear to everybody, to all you hamsters out there, we should be able to establish a new vertically integrated industry. And I heard what you, it's Ramon, isn't it? Yes. I did hear what you were saying and I totally concur with you, but we need to create many new jobs 
And hemp can do that because we can not only do that, we can replace imported oil with locally produced gas from ag waste and other biomass. We can generate increased economic activities through successfully creating new hemp jobs. Uh, am, we, uh, Mr. Ron, my apologies, I am so convinced of, of those words. Uh, last year, I, I also did a, um, um, an event that I call Industrial Hemp, the Employment Maker. I know that hemp can be uh, an engine to resolve a lot of issues, um, not just the environmental issues, but also to create employment. I am absolutely convinced with this. I think too, we need to get it out into mainstream. I mean, we need to have the industry appreciate the advantages of using it. And the only way we're going to do that is to prove that the product is better than what we presently have. And um, that's what we need to prove to them. I mean, Charles has said before, we don't have to go out and prove anything to them, but a lot of people got short memories, unfortunately. Very, very, very true. Now, look, even even to the yeah, new people they need to catch up on uh, what's well, there. We we had a uh, no the, the home expo. Him home expo. Hem, no, not him home expo. You remember when we went to the home expo in Perth? Yes, that's um, it. Last year, and there was a lot of other builders there, and people from the disabled industry as well. They all came to us and said, "We want it." You know, where can we get it? You know, type of thing. And then we're going, well, unfortunately, it's it's not here at the moment commercially. We can't give it to you. But I had women coming up to me with the blocks that I made and said, I want those blocks so I can go and make a garden bed so I don't have to get my husband to lay them because they're lighter. They're only five kilos and yep. compared to a 15 kilo block, which they don't like lifting. So um, women are out there that they, they, they are demanding. And, people, and one bloke said to me, he said, why isn't it here today? And I was saying, well, sorry, mate, we can't have everything today. You know? <laughs> but, so people are demanding it out there. Somehow we've got to get it together and get it happening so that our ideas become actions. And if we don't create something, we'll start doing something instead of, I mean, how, how long have you been talking about this, Ron? Since 1995. I, correct, um, correct. Now the other the other interesting thing, David, that you're talking about is we could make the make it make them into shipping pallets. A five yeah, kilo right. hemp pallet can outperform a forty kilogram hardwood timber pallet. Just one of the things that I've got in the presentation that you got a, that you've got a copy of, guys. Yeah. There's other things like bandages. You know, cotton bandages. Let's have hemp bandages. It, it's basically right. added material. Wrong. What we need to learn is to uplift our skills to uh, manufacturing no to raise capital correct that's correct. where we are lacking um but i believe that by collaborating and and and, and joining forces we can be stronger than than individuals because at Problem. the end of the day by uh, expecting to build a um, vertical vertical integrated company or industry you need a lot of people. You need Correct. people that are, you need planners, you need ex executors, you need, you need uh, engineers, you need architects, you need uh, processing machines, you need the inventors, you need everybody. Could I, could I ask Kim, I haven't heard much from Kim's thoughts at the moment. What's your thoughts, Kim? Um, I'm fairly new to this. Um, I've only just picked up, so I don't have a background going back to 1995. Um, my background is in IT, and um, I've since been made redundant a few years ago, uh, done some studies in uh, assessing houses. And so I'm coming at it from the point of view of um, construction of residential houses. Um, I do some consulting, helping people try and uh, make the houses better, either before they're built or afterwards. Um, it seems to me that the biggest issue at the moment is we don't have a good supply stream. We don't have farmers growing the stuff. And until you've got that, you just don't have anything to build on. 
Correct, correct, Kim. You're, you're quite right. But we also need to have big data anal analytics because the incomes that can be generated out of the hemp crop is amazing. Not mm. only educational fees, but carbon credits that can be generated out of it. Out of each, uh, out of each hemp crop, it puts four tonnes of soil organic matter back into the soil. That has got a dollar value to it. Unlike trees, it sequestrates much faster than a 20-year plantation does in within one one cropping season. Yeah, well, and the government doesn't take any doesn't take any of that into consideration. Well, uh, if I may, um, a couple of days ago, or I think no more than 72 hours ago, uh, the United States government has a, a pass a bill to uh, consider all farmers to, to uh, get credit for carbon capture. This means that the, um, uh, the attention for the next year to grow hemp will multiply exponentially. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna happen this year because it's already too late in the United States to, uh, to embrace this, but this is gonna, it's gonna be a game changer all over the world. Hope so. Definitely. Well, I mean, we still need to try and grow it here rather than importing it. Yeah. We, we, we've got it up in the Ord River. Uh, I've spoken to Ron about this before. Um, the ability to be able to go two crops a year up there. And back in, I think it was the 1990s, they tried growing cotton there and they had problems with the bugs and things like it, eating it. But um, hemp would grow really well up there. We get two crops a year. So, I mean, we've got the capacity and the Aboriginal groups up there started growing at it for a while, but it all gets down to the market. There's no much point in growing a crop unless you've got a, a somewhere for it to go. Yeah. And that's-, oh, that's it, Yeah, and equally there's, there's no market unless you've got a product. Yeah, I know, it's catch oh, it's, too, it's, so uh, which comes first, chicken or egg, you know? Um, well, let, 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 gentlemen, let me tell you something that uh, from, from my experiences, I have 120 dairy farmers as of two years ago that wants to get into the hemp market, but they want a process. They want somebody that can buy their products and not just the housing building market. That's where I, where I was coming from. And I think with, with the talks that we're doing, the more and more this happens, the more and more the understandings will be there for people to get involved. Agree. But, but it also it, it also means that uh, we have to look at sharecropping. I mean, not sharecropping, but uh, um, rotational uh, the rotational farming and the dairy farmers should be able to grow uh, rotational crops of hemp in between all the other stuff that they're feeding their animals, and it will increase their animal health. And that's all that's all coming for sure as well. Uh, and that's probably the easiest market for them if they can use them themselves and have happy and, and healthy cows. Uh, I, I know it, it hemp uh, is not so good with pig lard apparently, but apparently pig the pig industry would, would benefit from it too. And if you could sell our, our leftovers to the pig farmers uh, for the feed of the pigs, you'd have happy pigs. Oh, it's uh, antibiotic. Uh, it's antibiotic. It's if, good. What's good for us, it's good for them. Yeah. If you could, if you could um, have the milk from the cows that ate the hemp leaves, could you then sell it as hemp milk? Hemp milk. <laughs> Not quite as head milk, but I think you should you should be able to to uh, definitely uh, have a, a benefit coming out of that milk that comes out of a healthy cut hemp cow than what is out of a, out of a feedlot cow for sure. Yeah. That's definite. I mean, the the thing is, it just takes a bit of time to get the market up and running, um, and I I really am disappointed that since 1995 there has not been a great deal of differences yeah but now we're allowed to eat it uh, uh ron in, in the last three years since i've been involved we had big differences uh, when i first uh, got introduced to hemp uh, it, it came in a packet set only for external use and now we're allowed I, I, to eat i do agree seeds. with you i do agree with you um uh, compared with other pioneers, I'm a, also I'm a newcomer, has been in this business just about four years, but I've seen a great progress. On... And, and, and the Western Australian government seems to be behind you guys as well, which is probably better than the New South Wales government. Um, and and uh, that's where, you know, once we can introduce it to councils 
and and because they got all the machinery that that, that you can pack a stick at, uh, and this is is applications there as well, um, and then and then just uh, everybody should really grow themselves at home, uh, so they're not be cutting out the the, the, the drug dealers. Um, yeah, there's there's, a, there's lots of lots of positives, and and we just have to manifest the positive things and not the negative things. Just, just and it's also good for COVID. Of, um, we've got the Shire of Murray down our way, where I'm living. They're developing a eco park where businesses have come together to promote developing food based products within the Peel region, and the University of Murdoch is setting up a lab down there to develop uh, new and innovative products. One of those ones we've spoken to with um, Dr. Rezvani and myself, he has, he's Peter Davies, he's a, the um, vice chancellor of Murdoch University, and they would like to look at developing hemp plastic bags. Mm -hmm. So, there's a potential there to create a market. I've got people who can manufacture the bags as well, but we just need the raw material to be able to put through the extruders that they have to blow the bags. Do you have you talked to um, um, Paul Benham from uh, Hain Foods Australia? No, uh, his latest involvement. Yeah. He, he, he told me, uh, I've actually asked him that very question, can we make clear plastic now? And he said two years ago, I thought it was impossible, but no, I don't. And he's actually working with, a, with an American company or an American group of people, and they do hemp plastics that you can palletize, uh, so you can actually put it in your in injection molds and, and, and form it. So that, we we're very close on that one. But once again, Australia has given all the industries away to China at the moment, and we, we haven't got well, any We've still got yet. industries here that make plastic bags. Um, yeah. I yeah, know if you could get the raw material out of, out of America, probably better, or maybe even out of China. Probably yeah. more likely, actually. Well, that's what I'd like to do is to start manufacturing them here in Western Australia. I've got a company yeah. that's quite willing to use their equipment to do it, but they just well, need the raw material to do it. That, mm -hmm. I mean, plastics, plastic is the biggest problem on the planet. Uh, and and uh, hemp, I, I don't know too much about hemp resins and hemp plastics at this stage, but I'd like to learn more about that. Mm. Uh, but there's also people who have already been working on this for a lot longer uh, yeah, than really I have and everybody else. So. We we'll just have to Correct. get the right people together. Yeah. Correct. And, and, and if you look at Paul Blenheim, Paul Blenheim started in plastics as well when he came over from the UK. Oh, and right, I think, okay. And I think Martin took over the rest of that with Zeofoam, but then that collapsed. And Martin's yep. now bringing in from memory the paper out to make the plastic from uh, France. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we, that's, that's the other sad part about our operation, really. We're making hemp introduced from uh, Spanish hemp. At this stage, we haven't been able to successfully use my own products, but I'm hoping I'm happy to change that in the not too distant future. We've we've got a doctor, uh, Dr. Leslie Westerland, who's done a doctorate in paper making, and he's right. made hemp paper down at uh, Margaret River, and mm -hmm. um, he's got the equipment still there, but he's gone working up north at the moment because he can't get enough happening with it financially to make it viable. Yeah. So we've got the technology to make hemp paper and we've got the yeah. knowledge how to do it. We just need to, um, I mean, he can make a thousand A3 papers in, papers in a day out of the equipment that he's got, Yeah, which is quite amazing, really. David, David, the one thing that uh, I've got is a bamboo, is bamboo toilet paper, a rolled yeah. to bamboo toilet paper. Mm. And I know in New Zealand, that they are manufacturing hemp toilet paper in New Zealand. Well, I hear that they've put um, using uh, another plant called Jachofa uh, oil into the aircraft that fly them in New Zealand. So they can use hemp oil with aircraft engines as well. Yeah. So we can, we can blend them with other plant-based oils to make a, a biodiesel don't necessarily have to, because at the moment, like we've all been saying, we haven't got enough hemp to even make enough oil. So we need to use other plants to blend it together. Correct, correct. I mean, we can we can use any plastic and make it uh, make biodiesel out of. My yeah. ex business partner in carbon cutters, she's actually just won a hydrogen project. 
and she's now making biofuels from the waste of biomass. Mm. So yeah, it's very easy to do. You, David, we've been talking about it, but it takes mm. money to make that happen. And what we need, I just saw guys, anybody aware that Gina Reinhardt just got into uh, medicinal cannabis space? No, but I heard that she's, um, <clears throat> she has uh, uh, reserved $100 million for, for environmental projects. Mm -hmm. No, Ramon, she's actually invested quite a few millions. You know, uh, green over your way, green, it's on the, on the West, on the Australian Stock Exchange, Green Pharma. She invested, I think, $17 million into that company for about 15%. And that was just, just recent. Mm -hmm. I think we need to get more of these people that actually don't, that have got the money that have got spare money to put it into, like David, you were saying, we might call it the hemp bank. Yeah, exactly right. A, a, hemp, a hemp project bank. Hemp project bank. We used to have the Commonwealth Bank. It used to be for agricultural banking, but now it's become a uh, commercial bank. That is, um, that is one of the uh, missions of hemp engineering to help to materialize this idea because, yeah, Ron, you're, uh, I agree with you um, and Richard, we just need, we need to learn how to raise capital mm -hmm. because the ideas are already there. It's but happening. You know, it is happening. When you say that, you know, I mean, just give you one market example. If farmers planted 1 million hectares of hemp for fiber, it would produce 3 million tons of beautiful fiber for textiles. This would constitute just 4% of the world current annual fiber consumption for textiles, yep. which is 89 million tons per annum. Current cotton production globally is 29 million tons per annum. So the bulk of the fibers used for textiles are oil-based synthetics comprising almost of 60 million tons per annum. I mean, we got to transform these projects into one of the best examples of regenerative agriculture, both here and in Australia and abroad. And we work with people like Peter Andrews, Order of Australia for the Environment, Rehydrate This Old Landscape. But he also is in the same boat that if you wouldn't have pests if our environment was healthy. But Western farming has crucified our, uh, our, uh, our uh, environments for the farmers which we've seen from Monsanto's and Syngenta's and that sort of thing. So again, we've got to be very, very careful which way we go about it because we can also, with hemp, it can control weeds as, as, as well as anything else. You know, you see on TV, I don't know if you're down your way, but we see um, bamboo undies being advertised from New Zealand, I think. They make them. Um, why can't we do hemp undies, you know? Um, well, I have, I'm wearing hemp undies, but um, you, you can get them, but not made in China. Uh, they're all made in China and Cambodia. Oh, man. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, how ridiculous. Absolutely. I, uh, I mean, uh, you, everybody, I don't know whether you guys are wearing any hemp clothing at the moment, uh, but unless we are wearing hemp uh, more, more often, it's pretty hard to get in industry. So uh, mm. I guess we also have to be leaders, leaders in that too. Um, but... but um, we, we actually we we got a, a lady here in Nimbin uh, who's got a, a hemp uh, clothing uh, um, operation in Cambodia, and I'm wearing all her stuff. And uh, you can't wear any better than hemp. That's that's for sure. I've been trying to get some cloth from either China or in India to do mm -hmm. a hemp uh, fashion show uh, next year with the. Um, home expo that we have here in Perth, but it's yeah. pretty hard to get hold of people. Well, Mark, Mark at River Hemp uh, did a, a great uh, a, a combination with, with uh, at, at the last uh, last uh, hemp expo in, in Perth. And um, they used, uh, they, I think they supplied all, all the material. Uh, have hmm. you talked to them? This is, this is made uh, from Margaret River Hemp Company. Pa uh, fabric. Cloth fabric, yeah. Yeah. It's made the, a boat out of hemp as well. Yeah. Oh wow! And uh, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, Gary Rogers is, is he's one of the, the pioneers of your way, and uh, he's he's the one that told me you could grow your own home in one hundred days. Mm. And I guess I mean, we, we've uh, had been through a house up in Hillary's that was two story, 
and that was um, Matt Kilgallen built it. It sold within a week of being on the market. We went into the house and walking up the sec second story was the same temperature as the ground, ground floor. Mm. And that house was really comfortable to live in. And mm. the weather at the time was quite hot outside. Yeah. So it, it was a modern house. Um, when we first moved into it, you wouldn't know that it was made from industrial hemp. Yeah. Uh, but it just proves that we could change what got me interested. And I think I've mentioned it before to you, Richard, is that industrial hemp can be uh, used to save having heating costs. And a few years ago, I was listening to a program and these women came home from school and they all turned their air conditioning on. And within half an hour, all the power in the suburb went out because they overloaded the system. So if the people built out of hemp homes, they wouldn't have to have their air cons going on. And especially up in the north there of Western Australia, they turn them on all day, every day, seven days a week, and they're industrial size air conditioners. So we need to have yeah. better ones, you know. That well, uh, biodigesters is also something where we can uh, look into in the future as well. So uh, with, with with some of the biomass of, of hemp and all the other stuff, uh, you can actually uh, produce electricity and uh, run your farm on it. Mm -hmm. And you can also do it industrial for communities as well. One of my colleagues, uh, Mark Greathead in, uh, in, in Sydney, uh, is looking uh, at a team to, to, to make that happen as well. Uh, I think so the mining is... industry are very keen to get into something green. And, then, and if and we then can course, show them that, they'll be... Yeah. The batteries, you know, well, good you propose... can make that happen. Mm. What a good, I'm sorry. <laughs> what a good proposal uh, that eventually after this meeting, we could... Um, Massage the idea of the um, of the of the bank. Yeah, the ocean is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, Mr. Richard, uh, thank you very much. Ron, um, thank you for thank you having, much, having accepted the invitation to come to the master mind. Thanks, Pete. Yes. yes. Thank you, guys. And I am. We, so, I would love to invite you uh, privately to discuss further all those ideas and mm -hmm. and let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Right, Thank great. him too, but Thank I think he's gone. He was, yeah, he I'd love to. to. I'd love to uh, come over to Western Australia one of these days. Um, I'm and, glad and, when this COVID calms down a bit, it'd be great to be able to come and yeah. travel a bit more easily. At the moment, yeah, we all just, have to do everything uh, by Zoom. We have, have to get some, some crooked doctors on board who give us uh, the vaccination without the vaccination. <laughs> anyway, we'll find someone in the for you. sure. Thanks a lot, Thank Ron. You. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ron. Thank, thank you, Ron. Sorry, sorry, sorry for the IT issues. Uh, yeah. Don't worry. We, yeah. I will be editing this video, um, publishing in the next 48 hours. We'll, we'll take out okay. the hiccups. Thank you. And so, will, yeah, if you could send us a link, it. that'd be great. Uh, yeah, right. I will post it in two different, two different uh, yeah. videos. Okay? And, and thank you for your support, your technical support there, Ramon. And uh, thank you, uh, Dave, uh, for giving me the opportunity. And um, Thanks thank you, guys, for spending the, the time contrary, with me. Richard, with your ideas, your prototypes, mm -hmm. I foresee a very intimate future. In, okay, in well, that'd, that'd, be, that'd be nice. My, thank you. My, thank my you, attitude from little things, big things grow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Mr. Ron. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Ron. Thank you. Thank you all, and uh, hemp on. All right, hemp on. <laughs> See you, fellas. Right.